Well, folks, uh, gentlemen, we're, we're all set to begin. Uh, let's begin, first of all, with what Stephen Hawking said, and, and that was his claim that the laws of physics and not the will of God provides the real explanation for how life on Earth came into being. And Dr. Lennox, uh, you're the scientist, so let me begin with you. Is this a new claim from the scientific world? Not at all. I think that for the past while we've been getting people claiming that the laws of physics, even the laws of mathematics, can provide a satisfactory explanation for the origin of the universe. So there's nothing new here, and in my view it's as self-contradictory as it's ever been. Hmm. Well, Robbie, does it surprise you that scientists who long ago dismissed God feel this need to uh, continue to argue for his non-existence? Not in the general sense, Bob, because I think there'll always be those who would want to drive uh, this kind of uh, thinking to uh, the metaphysical realm, even though it's uh, uh, unfamiliar terrain to them in some ways. But I think it did surprise me that uh, Stephen Hawking went this route. You wonder whether something controversial is what uh, the listening or the reading audience wants to have in order to chase a book down or chase a program down, whether something of this nature was it exactly the oil into the flames to get the book read and so on. But uh, when he ended his last book and his comment was that, you know, now we've told you what, if we told you how or why, then we need the mind of God. Uh, ending on that note of submission to something transcendent was a noble way to end. So I don't know what's driving this, but his, uh, his uh, comment on it actually did catch me by surprise. I, I have it to say that. It would actually appear, I heard just recently, that it was the publisher, Ravi, that got him to put that bit in at the end. Because people over here in the media are saying he's essentially been an atheist all along. Uh huh. Well, you know, this is fascinating if that is so. And sometimes um, I have known in other realms publishers pushing for a certain line or a certain statement or a certain name or a certain word because that is precisely in this media dense society of ours what gets the book bought and sometimes never read, but certainly to be put on the shelf out there. <laughs> Well, Dr. Lennox, uh, you've said that Hawking's views are misguided because physical laws can never provide a complete explanation of the universe. Why not? Well, let's step back from that a little bit. The chief flaw, as I see it, in Hawking's argument, and of course there's no question, he's a brilliant theoretical physicist. I was just a bit behind him in Cambridge, and he is a very brilliant man. The book opened with a statement that philosophy is dead, which is a very odd statement for a man to make when his book is all about philosophy and the philosophy of science. And it seems to me that it's here that he's making his principal error. What he's doing is offering us a set of false alternatives. Either God created the universe or physical law. It's not simply physical law providing an explanation, which of course they do at a certain level of certain things. He is actually claiming that we don't need a creator because there's a law of gravity. Let uh, me quote a, exactly what he says. He says, because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. So he's saying that the law of gravity um, can displace God. Now, I have a series of objections to that. First of all, saying the universe is created from nothing is false because he says there is already a law of gravity, so it's not created from nothing. That's contradiction number one. Contradiction number two, which is even more serious, is that Offering us a choice between God and the law of gravity is like saying this. Here's a jet engine. I offer you the choice as an explanation of Frank Whittle, who invented it, or the laws of physics. That would be utterly absurd. In fact, you need both. You need both Frank Whittle, the agent who designed it, and you need the laws of physics. But it's even worse than that. Because if you Frank Whittle and the laws of physics, you still don't get a jet engine. You've got to have some matter for him to work on. And that brings me, sorry to go on a bit here, but that brings me to the central issue 
and it seems to me a very serious mistake. That is, laws do not create anything. They are our descriptions of what normally happens. The laws of physics don't even cause anything. The law of gravity or Newton's laws of motion never set a snooker ball going on a snooker table in the history of the universe. They describe it once you've got it. So I wonder if that makes sense. Well, Ravi, Dr. Lennox is talking about this conflict that Hawking has, has arranged, either God or science. How would you answer and that? you're absolutely right, John. I think this is uh, uh, the irony uh, of a man, actually, who is able to even speak to you and to me because of this unfortunate, debilitating disease of Lou Gehrig, where he's got this marvelous contraption through which he is able to process information, alphabet, language, sound. Uh, he would be the last one to self-reference that computer system as uh, self-explanatory. It took the scientist and took the uh, understanding of microchip technology and electronics and all of that and language to be able to take that which was possible and make it actual because it still took the designer to give him that voice. Uh, I can no more look at a beautiful car going on the highway and say, there goes the internal combustion engine, you know. Uh, it takes the designer who harnesses the design capacity to bring it to you and to me. Well, Dr. Lennox, you've, uh, you've written that uh, those civilizations that have ignored God have suffered because of that. Could you explain that comment to us? Well, what I wrote, I think you may be referring to a, a, a press article that I wrote. What I was referring to is one of the very interesting things in the history of science, that in Oxford, uh, there's a very famous expert in China, uh, Joseph Needham, and he was a Marxist, and what he tried to do was to explain the fact that there had been no scientific developments, really, in the sense of modern theoretical science. In China, there had been plenty of technology, but no scientific development. And he tried for a long time to understand this in terms of Marxist philosophy. But he ended by concluding that he couldn't do it that way. And he ended by concluding something like this, that the Chinese lacked the unifying concept of a creator. It seems to me this is enormously important in connection with Hawking because the great men of science originally, like the person who held Hawking's chair, Sir Isaac Newton, their motivation for doing their science was actually faith in the creator. C.S. Lewis has put it brilliantly when he said, men became scientific because they expected law and nature and they expected law and nature because they believed in a creator. And uh, so it seems to me there's an important lesson from the history of science, the contribution of the Christian belief in God is highly significant to the rise of modern science as we know it. Let me take that down to a personal lever, uh, level. Uh, if you believed Hawking's claim, would you see a need to study science? Well, it would depend which claim that Hawking is making, because <laughs> he's, he's claiming that what he's got is a final theory. Um, it's very hard for me to put myself in the hypothetical situation of believing his claim, and I'll tell you why. Because the claim is self-contradictory at three different levels. I don't think I've ever met anything like that quite before. I mentioned that earlier, because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Now, we've already seen the law of gravity, and gravity are not nothing. But listen to the second bit. The universe will create itself. Well, now, if I say X creates Y, what I mean is that I'm presupposing the existence of X to explain the existence of Y. That's common understanding of the language. So if I say X creates X, I'm presupposing the existence of X in order to account for the existence of X. And that's self-contradictory, and it's logically incoherent, even if we do, as Hawking does, put X equal to the universe. And that sounds to me like something out of Alice in Wonderland. It's not science. You know, so uh, sorry, I, John, I, go ahead. Yes, you go ahead, No, no, Ravi. no, please finish that thought. I was just going to leapfrog on that one there. Well, I, I was just going to say that the question to me was if I believed Hawking's claim, but I can't believe self-contradictory 
strange. And um, he sounds very much to me like Peter Atkins, an Oxford colleague, who said, space-time generates its own dust in the process of its own assembly. And I think one of the best comments on it was Keith Ward's comment. He's prof Regis Professor Emeritus um, of Theology here in Oxford. He says, look, it's logically impossible for a cause to bring about some effect without already being in existence. And then he ends, between the hypothesis of God and the hypothesis of a cosmic bootstrap, there's no competition. We were always right to think that persons or universes who seek to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps are forever doomed to failure. And that seems to be the heart of the matter, Ravi. It's absolutely right, John. And uh, you are familiar with John Conwell, uh, yes. who, yeah, who's the director of Cambridge Science and Human Dimension Project at Jesus College in Cambridge. And uh, his comment, which is rather uh, fascinating in commenting on Hawking's uh, conclusion, he says, dare I suggest that it be the oracular Professor Hawking who is failing to keep up with the philosophers and the theologians rather than the other way around. You know, I would actually go push this comment even further back. You go back all the day, all the way back to the days of Aquinas and the idea of, you know, the three possibilities of uncaused, self-caused, or caused by another. And you've just taken us through that. To be self-caused, you'd have to exist before the effect. Uh, to be uncaused, you'd have to have a total existence of nothing, no thing, which something even Aristotle couldn't define when he said it's that which rocks dream about, uh, bringing in the existence of a rock in order to talk of a dream. Uh, and so you get the uncaused and self-caused as actually ending up in some form of contradiction. It has to be the caused by another. And what uh, Einstein said in the convergence of three ultimate realities to him, actually, you know, he talked about music, the laws of nature and, quote, God or mind. I think he had that reverence for the possibility that something greater than merely a law was at work, and he was willing to take that step back and leave it uh, in time and discovery for a absolute negation of this sort, to me, is nothing more than gimmickry and defies both science and logic.